One week before Christmas, 1777, the 10,000 weary men of George Washington's army marched into the rolling hills of southeastern Pennsylvania to a place called Valley Forge. One in three was unfit for duty. Men without clothes to cover their nakedness, without blankets to lay on, without shoes. Their marches might be traced by the blood from their feet marching through frost and snow. George Washington. Cloth tents could not protect the men from the brutal winter, so they began to clear the forest to build huts. From Valley Forge, Washington could keep an eye on the British, 21 miles away in Philadelphia. And a winter encampment in a remote place without distractions was exactly what the commander-in-chief needed. Washington meant to forge a real army this winter, disciplined and uniformed, men who would not retreat at the sight of a bayonet. He wanted an army like the English had, one of the ironies of Washington was that he was rather pro-British, and he wasn't pro-British politically, obviously. He tried to model the Continental Army along the lines of a traditional European uh, army. So he was a, a conventional 18th century thinker. Harsh discipline was routine. At Valley Forge, a court-martial sat nearly every day. An officer caught stealing had his sword broken over his head in front of his company. Deserters received a hundred lashes for the first offense, and the punishment would be drawn out for days. The men repeatedly ignored the rules of sanitation. Washington finally had to issue an order that any man caught relieving himself anywhere but at the latrines would be court-martialed. Washington knew that he had to be tough. He had to, he had to call on the men who were willing to, to do the things they need to do to keep a 18th century army in line. And by, I mean, that even means executing men when you have to in order to make sure that they understand that the rules are the rules. One of the factors about whippings, the floggings, uh, that were used as punishments in armies and navies of the 18th century is that you are inflicting a very, very painful surface wound that will leave a permanent scar so that people will know you had misbehaved, but that don't permanently disable the individual because then he's no good as a sailor or a soldier. Washington had only three months to mold an army before spring arrived and the fighting resumed. On February 23rd, 1778, a foreign volunteer appeared in Washington's camp. The 47-year-old Baron Friedrich Wilhelm Ludolf Gerhard Augustine von Steuben introduced himself as a general and former aide-de-camp to King Frederick of Prussia, the greatest military mind of the age. Von Steuben claimed to be an expert at teaching military drill but he asked for no pay and no rank until he proved himself. Impressed with von Steuben's credentials, Washington gave him the title of acting inspector general and the monumental task of training the American army. The units of each state marched differently. They had no standard procedure for handling weapons. Their muskets were rusted. Barely half had bayonets, and most of those were used as spits to cook meat when they had meat to cook. Von Steuben, more impressed with the rebel spirit than with their discipline, wrote to a friend in Europe. You say to your soldier, do this, and he does it. But I am obliged to say, 
This is the reason why you ought to do that. And then he does it. Although von Steuben could curse in three languages, he couldn't speak English. Every night, he wrote out the next day's orders in German. Then his aide translated them into French, and a French-speaking American translated them into English. Right wheel, five. Front. By the end of winter, von Steuben delivered what he promised, a closely drilled army. Yet he turned out to be an imposter. He was neither a baron nor a general. In fact, he had left the military 14 years earlier after rising no higher than captain. George Washington didn't care. Von Steuben had performed a miracle. He was promoted to major general. Well into spring, the men were still hungry, half naked, and plagued by diseases, dysentery, smallpox, fevers, tormenting rashes. By early May 1778, 2,000 men had died in camp. 2,000 more had deserted. The amazing thing to me is that uh these people deserted in such small numbers. People generally point out, well, one in 10 deserted at uh, Valley Forge. One is questioned, you know, is tempted to ask the question, what kept the other nine around? I think the soldiers of the revolution uh, suffered the privations and the hardships because of peer pressure. I think that was the, the major factor. The bottom line is, your buddy in the mess, you know, the, the guy that you uh, cook this measly portion with and stand out in the rain with. That's going to be the real key to uh, putting up with uh, something as long as they did.